coming up on the Branding Deep Dive podcast. And so I went up to him and I said, Joe, is there a problem? He said, yeah, Scott, I just can't find the right words. Here's a bright young graduate guy. And um, so it's, it's, not a, it's not a problem with his intelligence or level edu of education. And so I just very simply said to him what I always say when somebody has this issue. And I said, well, Joe, what are you trying to say? And explain it to me as if you were explaining it to your mum or your dad or your sister or best friend, your significant other. And he said, well, so Joe then said, well, what I really mean, Scott, is da -da 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 -da. and I said, that was so clear and so fantastic and sounded like you write that. That's your first draft. And he said, wow, you're right. And, and he said to me, do you know what? What you're teaching us is it's okay. You're giving us permission to write more conversation, to write more as we speak, so it sounds more like us. This is Ahmed Shima, and welcome to the Branding Deep Dive podcast. If you're new here, this is a podcast where we have in-depth discussions with founders, marketers, and brand strategists on how to build a brand that people love. Today, we're talking to Scott Kieser, the writing guy. With the right words, you can sell anything, a product, a service, idea, or even a belief. But understanding how to formulate the right words is a riddle only a few people understand. Scott Kieser is one of those few. A lifelong lover of the English language, Scott understands the power of words to move, bewitch, and persuade. Since 2004, he's helped over 5,000 professionals find their voice, write human, and get the results they want from the words they write. His clients include The Economist Group, all of the big four accounting firms, three international law firms, and two barrister chambers. He's the author of two groundbreaking books, Winner Takes All, on how to double your tender win rate, and Rhetorica. Wanting to share his secrets with the world, he's created a system of 15 persuasive writing techniques. In this episode, we dive deep into why learning to write well is so important, how to find your voice, how to stop writing in passive voice, and much more. If you're looking to improve your writing, this episode is a must listen. Now here's Scott. For the audience that may not be familiar with who you are and the work you do, uh, can you give them a brief introduction? Sure. Um, yeah, happy to be on the show, Ahmed. Uh, so my name is Scott Kieser, and I have to specify that because uh, my, my last name is spelled K-E-Y-S-E-R, and people often say uh, Scott Kaiser, but it's Kieser, and I call myself the writing guy. Um, what I do is I work mainly in professional services, so predominantly with lawyers, accountants, engineers, consultants, architects. I was even training a bunch of scientists last week. And um, the thing about professional services is that everyone writes, but not everyone's a writer. So their writing lets them down. What I do with the help of my Rhetorica writing system, which is has been 19 years in the making, is I help them to find their voice, write human with a capital H, and get the results that they want from the words that they write, whether that's a bid, a blog, or a book. In other words, I help people to write with impact. Uh, my clients include, I don't know whether any of your listeners, Ahmed, are readers of The Economist, uh, but I trained staff of The Economist Group for a decade. I've worked with all of the big four, four accounting firms like Ernst & Young, now EY, Deloitte & Touche, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, KPMG, three international law firms, two barristers' chambers, and a whole, whole host of other organisations. And I've written two books, as you might expect of somebody who calls himself the writing guy. Uh, I am twice published. Scott, let's start with um, your, your journey to where you are today. Have you always been the writing guy or how did you become the writing guy? What was that journey like? Well, do you know, it's so, it's so funny, Ahmed, because only, only yesterday, <laughs> only yesterday, somebody that I was at primary school with uh, uh, at the age of eight, a lovely lady called Caroline, who actually we, yeah, we, we kind of teased mercilessly, but uh, and I feel really bad about that as well. She's become a, a, a friend. And um, she was going through her archives the, the other day, going through her old books and files and school reports. And she came across a story that I'd written at the age of eight called I Am a Shoe. And I, I, I imagine it's a story about it's very short. 
it, and I imagine I'm a shoe being being made and these horrible old factory men are sticking needles in me because I'm, I'm made of leather and then I get bought by a young boy and his mum but then he goes running and playing in the mud and, and he wakes up the next morning to find out <laughs> that his mum has thrown thrown his shoes away i.e me because they were so muddy so they got sport on day one <laughs> uh, probably deeply freudian but anyway i mean the reason i'm telling you that <laughs> it is called i am a shoe the reason i'm telling you that is actually from as long as i can remember i've been in love with writing and the written word and this amazing English language of ours and um, you know it, it's all really been leading up to what I do now which is I'm on a bit of a mission a very modest mission to transform the writing skills of a billion people around the world because I reckon I've nailed how to write well I've got a system that that, that has nailed it so as I say you know Ahmed a Scott. modest ambition <laughs> Hmm. So one thing that I wanted to ask you, um, I have a few, uh, there's a few like college students that I kind of, um, I would say like a mentor, they, they have like uh, meetings every so often just to kind of, you know, if I was in your shoes, this is what I'd do. They ask me questions, like kind of thing. Um, and one of the things that like, I always try to like push on them is like to develop their writing skills. I worked at Amazon and I'm sure you've, you've heard um, the whole Amazon writing culture where basically like what we do at M or what we did at, like, I don't work there anymore. So what we did at Amazon was literally like, there's no PowerPoint presentations. What you do anytime you have like a project or proposal is you write like a six page memo. And then mm -hmm. uh, you don't like send it out beforehand. You schedule a meeting and then everyone sits in the meeting for the first 20 minutes, it's just silent. And everyone just reads the memo, right? And the, and the idea, the concept is like, if your writing is good enough, it shouldn't need someone to present it. Right. Because a lot of times in like presentations, you can have like a really good presenter, someone that has like a really nice slide deck and really just charisma with the way they speak. Uh, they can get like, you know, you, you may be blinded by some of the flaws in the process and stuff. But when you're writing, you have to really clarify your thinking and really get your point across. So uh, what I wanted to get your opinion on as someone who works with uh, a lot of professionals. Right. Like and it seems like people that are in this college stage don't recognize how important that this actual skill of writing is. Uh, so the question is like, why is it so important to develop the skill of writing? Sure, sure. It, it, it's a brilliant question, Ahmed. I mean, uh, there are lots of different ways I could answer that. Um, the first thing I'd say is that every single study that has ever been conducted into literacy, in other words, people's ability to read and write well, has come to the same conclusion. And that is that the ability to read and write well affects your life chances. It affects a whole range of, of quality of you know, aspects of your, the quality of your life from, and in no particular order, from your earning power, your social mobility, your civic participation, your health, even your longevity, your self-confidence, your self-esteem. And so I you know, I think justifiably refer to it as a life skill. So the ability to read and write well is a life skill. And that once you've mastered it, you know, the world is, is effectively your oyster. And you can do pretty much whatever you want to do, obviously, as long as it's, as long as it's legal. Um, and, and and so it is about the ability, I mean, it's almost like um, the ability to write well is almost like um, piloting a, a time machine, because once you've captured or nailed or expressed your ideas, your concepts, your recommendations, um, you can change the world through the written world, word, and many people have. And the reason I refer to it as a time machine is because we can still hear the voice of Aristotle, Socrates and Plato 3000 years after they are long gone. Um, their voice can still resonate in our ears with their amazing ideas. And Aristotle in particular, I refer to him in my training because he is the granddaddy of a, of a subject called rhetoric, which is the art of persuasion. And in 384 BC, when he was swanning around ancient Athens in his toga or whatever they used to wear then he wrote a treatise called rhetoric 
and he nailed the subject of rhetoric, which is the art of persuasion. And amongst many things, he he identified the three what he referred to as persuasive appeals, which are logos, which is Greek for word, which is where we get the word logic from. That's about appealing to the rational brain of our reader. Uh, the second persuasive appeal is ethos or ethos. And we borrow that word. It refers to the character or reputation of the, the messenger. Uh, so no matter how beautifully you write, if you have no credibility with your reader, then your message won't land. And then the third persuasive appeal is pathos, which is much neglected in its ancient Greek for passion or emotion. And what he meant by that is we need, through our words, we need to evoke emotions in our reader because emotions are very powerful in driving the reader to change their behavior. So what I say when I talk about writing and the power of writing and why it's a life skill is that writing, the, the, my system teaches people not to write necessarily pretty, beautiful, you know, flowing sentences, although that has a place, but it's writing that changes the reader's behavior. It's about behavior change. And that's why if you've mastered that skill, then you can build rapport through the written word, you forge a connection with your reader, even if they've never met you before, so that by the end they know, like, and trust you, and they are therefore likelier to do what you're asking them to do, as long as it's in their interest to do so. Um, so it is, a, it is an incredibly powerful tool or skill. And just going back to to how I, I answered your question initially, in these international literacy studies, what I've observed keenly is that they, they major on the ability to read to the detriment of the ability to write. So a lot of the international literacy studies are very imbalanced. Um, and I don't really know why that is. Maybe because the ability to assess somebody's writing is very difficult. Whereas it may it maybe it's yeah. easier to assess their ability to read, but I think we're missing a trick because the ability to read and the ability to write are flip sides of exactly the same coin, and, um, and so you know I it is a it is a life skill. Can you explain what you mean by um, reading and writing are two sides of the same coin? Well, because the the ability you know we 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 know what both mean. The ability to read well is the ability to read to be a fluent and fluid and confident reader such that you can read virtually any piece of text and you, you know, as long as it's well written, obviously, and you can, you understand the intended meaning of that text, the, the meaning that the writer wanted to put from their brain into your brain. That's the ability to read well. And obviously the ability to write well is the opposite direction in that you become the writer and how good are you at clarifying and expressing sometimes very complex ideas through the written word such that your reader gets it ideally in one go in one reading and that is rare mm. that is extremely rare um, because of course the risk is if we get our reader to reread and reread and reread our stuff we're going to lose them most people don't want to have to cudgel their brains to to get your meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Scott, I want to get into some like tactical things, um, or actual writing. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I've seen, uh, one of the um, objections or we can say mental barriers that people have when it comes to writing mm -hmm. is uh, this statement that you've probably heard many times uh, is that I'm just not a good writer. Uh, and so I want to get your response to that. Um, can writing be learned or is it something you're born with? Um, I, I have a feeling I know what your answer is going to be on that one, but I would love to hear your thoughts. No, listen, Ahmed, and that's another brilliant question uh, because this comes up all the time. I, I believe, and of course I would say this, wouldn't I, but I have I have trained over 5,000 professionals uh, in the last 19, 20 years, and the feedback I've got is consistently very, very good that I believe, I mean, I know that writing is a learnable skill. Um, it, it's not, I so sort of often say that we need to get away from the idea that you are, it's not some kind of ninja style black art, nor is it a, a something that you're born with. Um, 
I believe that with my system, anybody who can already read and write, obviously we're talking about literate people, uh, people who, who already know how to read and write, basically, that anybody using my system can, it, can improve their, their writing. They can transform their writing, sometimes very, very quickly. So it is a lear it is a learnable skill. It's like any other skill, whether it's cooking or riding a bike. As long as you use my techniques and my system comprises 15 techniques, five planning, five drafting, five editing, as long and you don't even have to use all 15 to improve your writing. You only need to use a handful of them. As long as you use those and you apply them and practice them, there there's no way that your writing isn't going to improve. So it is to answer your question, it is totally a learnable skill. And that's why with my system, which which you know the latest version of it I've I've only really nailed in the last year or two, is I'm going global with it. I'm going into schools, colleges, obviously I'm already in business, but I'm taking it into schools, colleges, prisons, employment centers, you know, anybody who listen who will listen to me. <laughs> Does that help? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I want to get into the actual um, the system, but before we get into that, I want to yeah. ask you about like there's this concept of uh, writing with your authentic voice or write, like finding your voice. Mm -hmm. um, what, yeah. so, like, before we like number one, I guess the first question is like what is your voice? This concept of like mm -hmm. you know finding your voice, and then how do you actually find it? Another great question, or in fact, two two great questions. So first of all, what, what is our authentic voice? Your authentic voice is when your reader can he hear you and your personality through your words. So your writing sounds like Scott or sounds like Ahmed or sounds like, uh, you know, any one of your listeners that they can hear uh, what's referred to as the authorial voice, the author's voice through the words. So you get a real sense of the person, the human being behind the words. And that's, and that's why I, say, I said in my introduction that I help people to write human with a capital H, uh, because far too much uh, B2B, business to business writing has been dehumanized and uh, it almost sounds robotic. And um, so I think we can hear, you see, what's interesting is that there's a very strong auditory element to writing, which is sort of paradoxical, because even though obviously people are reading uh, the words on a page or a screen, there is music and cadence and rhythm to our writing as well, because what came first was not writing, but speech. And there's a brilliant writer, I'm looking at his book now, called Peter Elba, I think he's an American. And he says, we must use what we must use the skill that we find easiest, in other words, speaking, to help us with the skill that we find hardest, in other words, writing. And he's absolutely right. So it is there is a very strong auditory element to great writing. So that's to answer your first question. The second question is, how do we find our voice? So the best way and how do I help my clients find find their voice? The best way is that I tell you a little story, which is a true story, and it happens every time, every time I run my workshop. It happened again. I was running a workshop on Tuesday two days ago, and it happened uh, with a guy called Joe. So um, Joe, in in the afternoon, so my my signature product, if you like, is a one day workshop. So you know, it, it's face to face. It's in person. I go into the into the office of the of the client of the organization and I had I had 10 people on Tuesday and in the afternoon so in the morning I share the 15 writing techniques of my rhetorical system with them and then in the afternoon I get them to uh, it's the lot what I call the longer writing exercise and it's their opportunity to apply to their own writing my rhetorica persuasive writing techniques because obviously you know, that that makes it totally relevant to them and um, i asked them to bring in a, a piece of writing to work on in that exercise and this always happens i kind of know to expect it now and i could tell that joe was 
you know, so they've all got their heads down and they're they're looking at the techniques and they're 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 working on their own writing. And I could tell that Joe is getting really flustered. And so I went up to him and I said, Joe, is there a problem? And he said, Yeah, Scott, I just can't find the right words. He is a bright young graduate guy, and um, so it's, it's not a, it's not a problem with his intelligence or level edu of education. And so I just very simply said to him what I always say when somebody has this issue and I said well Joe what are you trying to say and explain it to me as if you were explaining it to your mum or your dad or your sister or best friend or your significant other and he said well so Joe then said well what I really mean Scott is da -da 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 -da. and I said that was so clear and so fantastic and sounded like you write that that's your first draft and he said, wow, you're right. And, and he said to me, do you know what? What you're teaching us is it's OK. You're giving us permission to write more conversationally, to write more as we speak. So it sounds more like us. And it happens every time. Every time I run a workshop, I say, well, what are you trying to say? Explain to me as if you were explaining to your mum or your dad or your significant other. And, and there's something, Ahmed, in the there is immense power in the in verbalizing and vocalizing out loud what we're trying to say. So one of the things, Scott, I um, you know read in your bio is that you helped Ernst and Young, Ernst and Young double its tender win rate, um, and then also you helped an international outsourcing company when like move its tender win rate from fourteen percent to seventy one percent just after two days. I'm uh, really curious to hear just the story behind these. Like, uh, is it the same framework that you implemented at these companies to help them win their tender rate? Uh, and for the audience that may not be familiar with professional services, what is uh, a tender uh, and what does a win rate mean? So there, there, there are many different uh, names for uh, what essentially means the same thing. Uh, bids, tenders, competitive tender, proposal or pitch. Uh, pitch is very common in professional services, you know, in law firms, accounting firms, uh, architecture practices. And what it simply means is, is that a client, um, if a client needs some kind of service provided, let's say it's a group of schools um, that, that need a, a, a cleaning contract, uh, they need their schools to be cleaned, they would then tender, which is just a posh way of saying offering, that opportunity to the market and cleaning companies would respond to that invitation to tender uh, with a bid or an offer saying, you know, we can, we can, uh, this is our approach to cleaning. This is our experience of cleaning schools. This is what we charge for to clean your group of schools. And they would submit a response to that uh, invitation to, to tender or RFP, which stands for request for a proposal. It's really just the, a, a way for uh, clients to to go out into the marketplace and get bids or offers for a contract uh, that they need delivering. It's it's as simple as that. And obviously, you know, almost without exception, every competitive tender is it begins with a with a written response. And and often the second stage would be uh, what's referred to as a beauty parade, uh, which is an oral presentation the second stage where the client, a panel of buyers from the client organization would then meet the, uh, the, the, the uh, selection of shortlist of the tenderers and the tenderers would then present their bid or their offer or their ideas to the panel. Uh, and then out of that, they, the, the client would appoint one. And that's why my first book is called Winner Takes All, because, you know, when you're involved in a competitive tender, there is typically only one winner. Uh, there's no place for uh, there's no rewards for second place and so that you know that that's why i titled my book now and that's all we mean and, and your bid win rate is the proportion of bids that you respond to and that you win so out of the total number if you respond in a year to 100 and you win 25 that's a 25 percent bid win rate that's all that means yeah Awesome. And then um, when you were working with these companies to improve mm. their bid win rate, 
Um, what are, I guess, like, what are the common pitfalls you saw in what they were doing and how did you help them get past that? Okay, great question. Um, I'll tell you what the common most, uh, the most common problem or issue or mistake I see bidders make, uh, and I, and I saw this 30 years ago when I first started and it hasn't gone away. And I see this wherever in the world I work. And I see this in every industry sector I work in, bar none. And that is what I refer to as weeing all over the reader. What I mean by that is they talk only about themselves and uh, very little about the client. So they say, we are ABC Inc. We're great at this. We're great at that. We could do this. We could do that. We have done this. We have done that. We're great. We have an unrivaled network. Choose us. Yeah, we're fantastic. It's all about them, not about the buyer or the client. And that's why, and the predominant word is we, us, and our. And that's why I suddenly refer to it as weeing all over the reader. And it's an instant, it's, it's an instant loss. Because when I ask clients, you know, that I'm training or delegates, or whatever, and I say, given the choice between themselves and you, who are your clients typically more interested in? And people go, well, duh, yeah, themselves. So therefore, if we are writing about ourselves and not them, we're already on the back foot. So weeing all over your reader or your client in your bid, talking predominantly about yourselves and not about them, and the benefits to them is the single biggest issue I see. And that, ironically, Ahmed, is, is less to do with writing and it's more to do with mindset. It's about emotional intelligence. It's about the desire to really add value to the client or the buyer. It's the, the readiness to walk a mile in their shoes and in the, in the shoes of every single individual decision maker in the client, which takes some work. Uh, and, it's, and it's enthusiasm, genuine enthusiasm for their business. Um, if you don't do any of those things, then you are going to suffer from a, a low uh, bid win rate. Mm. Uh, next thing I wanted to ask you about is um, the, the Trolls uh, ebook that you sent. Uh, yeah. You? I really <laughs> enjoyed reading that. Um, I, okay. I think one of the things that, um, so I have one, like a guy that I work with, he's in college and he creates like scripts for YouTube videos for uh, this channel. Um, mm -hmm. And like recently, we've just had like a lot of back and forth where like his writing, his concepts are good, right? Like he's able to do the research, he's put, he puts mm -hmm. together like uh, an argument, but then like the writing is just not like active. It's just like everything he does is like in passive voice. And I think it's wow. because like in college, um, that's probably <clears throat> what they're, they're used to, right? They're trying to mm -hmm. get the word counts. They're, you know what I mean? They're just trying to add a little bit of words. And so like, what I've been struggling with is like, how do I teach this guy to use active voice regularly and make it like, you know, like you're actually talking. Um, sure. and, and so yeah. I know in your, in the ebook, you had uh, slippy, right. And uh, mm. you did a really great job of explaining, okay, this is what it looks like and here's how you avoid it. And so if you could just like, for someone like me, that's trying to coach someone on not mm. using uh, passive mm. voice, how would you, how would you go through that? Yeah, okay, that's a, that that that's a great question. Um, so a couple of things. First of all, one thing that you must the first thing that he needs to do, this guy who's working with you on the scripts, he before he sends them to you, he must read them out loud, mm. because by doing so, and every professional writer does what I call ROL. It's one of the fifteen rhetorical techniques. By when he reads his writing out loud before he sends it to you. He will hear that it sounds clunky and full of the passive voice, passive itis, I call it. Uh, he, he will just, it will become immediately obvious to his, to his ears. Because writing that is hard to read, sorry, writing that, that is hard to, um, that doesn't hear, that sound very good, is, hard, is going to be hard to read. So reading out loud is just, it's a ludicrously simple, incredibly effective way of assessing your writing, both as an editing tool, but also as a way of judging the t its tone of voice. It, it's it's really interesting because I I was talking to this same group of graduates I was training on Tuesday, and they were really self-conscious about reading their writing out loud. But I said, 
just get over that self-consciousness. I kind of get it, but but if you let it block you from doing ROL, you are missing a huge trick. There is a reason why every professional writer reads their writing out loud. So that's that's the first thing he must do. The second thing is, um, in order, how do you cure the passive voice? How do you turn your passives into actives? And I don't know how grammatical you want me to get here, Ahmed, but the first as, thing that you as need... As grammatical as you'd like. <laughs> okay, thanks. So I've got permission to be uber grammatical. So yeah. the, the first thing that, that um, he needs to do in a sentence, he needs to identify who or what is taking the action. Okay. Uh, take, technically known as the agent or the actor. And let's just say the, 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 the person taking the action is somebody called Sam. Let's say the, I'll give you maybe the easiest thing, I'll give you an example, very simple. The memo was written by Sam. That's in the passive voice. Who is the agent or the actor? In other words, who's taking the action? It's obviously Sam. So in the active voice, you launch the sentence with Sam because he or she, because it could be Samantha, is is the writer is taking the action you then have to identify the verb and the verb is obviously the past tense of the verb to write so rather than the memo has been written you would then say sam wrote which is the perfect tense sam wrote or i think it's technically known as the past simple but you know uh, let's not let's not get too technical <laughs> sam wrote and then you have to identify the object what is Sam writing? It's obviously the memo that becomes the object. So you've got a very simple sentence of Sam wrote the memo uh, in the active voice. And the active voice forces us to state who is doing what to whom. Subject, verb, object. Sam, subject, wrote, verb, o um, the memo, object. SVO, subject, verb, object. So he needs to get into the habit he needs to really understand how you form the passive voice. And, and I just, I'm sure he's doing it unconsciously. Mm -hmm. He needs to become aware that that's what he's doing. And then he needs to use that very simple technique to convert his passives into actives. Now, having said that, there are four occasions where it may serve him to use the passive voice. And would it be useful if I ran through those? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the four, the four typical scenarios where it serves us to use the passive in no particular order is the first one or one of them, one of the four, is what I call CYA language, cover your ass, or ass as I think you guys say on this side of the, <laughs> the pond. It's cover your backside language. So I'll give you an example. I don't know whether any of you guys have been on, on your side of the pond, have been following the, the grilling that Boris Johnson, who is our former prime minister, has, has been going through. But basically, during the COVID pandemic, we were banned from gathering. You couldn't no more than three. You couldn't have more than three people in a gathering. Whereas he he held parties at number ten Downing Street for his staff, numbering eight, ten, fifteen people. And so basically, he's been sort of he's come come up in front of parliamentary committee. And he's just he's been using the passive voice all over the place. And I'll give you an example. So he's, he said something like parties were held. In other words, we don't know who held the parties. Rules were rules may have been breached. Passive voice. We don't know who breached the rules. Mistakes probably were made. We don't know who made the mistakes, but lessons will be learned. We don't know who's going to learn the lessons. Classic backside covering accountability fudging language yep so that's that's when we might legitimately want to use the passive voice alternatively we also might want to sound a bit less confrontational mm -hmm. so let's just suppose a client of mine had been slow in paying an invoice i might go to them and say you haven't paid my invoice but that would be pretty pretty in their face so i might say tom my invoice hasn't been paid yet. That's the passive voice. Yeah. So that's the first scenario. Uh, CYA or to be to be more diplomatic. 
The second scenario is when we simply don't know who took the subject. A shot was fired. Tragically, in 1963, John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. Um, my wife and I went on holiday and we were burgled. We don't know who did any of those horrible things, okay? That is where the, the actor or the agent is unknown. The third scenario is when the actor or the agent just doesn't matter. And the classic example would be the file was uploaded to the server. It does. It was probably an automatic process. It probably wasn't done by a human being anyway. And, um, and, and what matters is this is where the action is more important than the actor or the agent. OK. And then the fourth and final scenario where it serves us to use the passive is when we're trying to emphasize the, the object. It was the handcrafted, vellum printed hieroglyphic memo that was written by Sam. We're emphasizing the object, not who wrote the memo. Other than those four, we need to be writing in the active voice, subject, verb, object. That was, uh, that was super helpful. Um, another thing that uh, was in the, uh, the trolls is, is called nanonitis. Mm -hmm. um, this is, is interesting, but like, I've definitely seen this. I didn't know it was like a, a thing, right? So for the audience that may not be familiar with nounitis, um, mm. you know, it's just using too many nouns. So mm. at yeah. first glance, when I first read that, I was like, why is using too many nouns a bad thing? Mm. So yeah, th that's the question. Why is it a bad thing? And how do you actually uh, avoid using too many nouns? Okay, sure. Um, for, first of all, I have to give credit where it's due and... Uh, whenever I write about nounitis, I always credit somebody called Rupert Morris, who is a fellow Brit and um, a fellow uh, writing doctor. And he coined the term, I think it's a brilliant term, in, in a book he wrote called The Right Way to Write, uh, published by Piatkus. So I'm a great believer in giving credit where it's due. I didn't, and sadly, I didn't invent the term. Um, the reason why the overuse of nouns is a problem, particularly abstract nouns, is that nouns are naming words and they just sit there naming stuff in your writing but they don't drive the narrative along mm. the the way we cure so you know, i'll give you an example in a moment the way one of the effects of using too many nouns is you end up with noun strings so you might say um the the hospital's monday monday morning meeting agenda item where it's just a string of abstract it's horrible yeah, can you imagine reading a document that's just full of nouns like that? Um, it's, so, as I say, the problem now is they just naming st name stuff, but they drive the, the story along. The cure for nouns is to you is to replace them with verbs, because as I'm sure all your listeners know, verbs are words of action and doing. A very simple example. Uh, here's an example of uh, a very acute nounitis which somebody recently described as a viral outbreak of nouns, of abstract nouns. So we might say our specialism, noun, is the provision, noun, of health, noun, solutions, noun. So that is a, a very short sentence, just kind of bogged down in yeah. four abstract nouns. I was going to say, that's a really good example. Like, I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So if we replace as many of those nouns as possible with verbs, then we end up potentially with something that says, or something like, we specialize, so rather than specialism, we specialize in providing from the noun provision, health solutions. And that's better. You've got two verbs, specialize and provide, and two nouns, health and solutions. But there's a problem with that version. And the problem with that version is that one of those words is a sow, a severely overused word. And it is the word provide. Because every time you use the verb provide, you have to follow it with a noun. As in, we provide solutions, we provide advice, we provide support. Just use the main verb and say, we solve, we support, we advise, we guide. So in the third version, you end up with something like we specialize verb in solving verb your p 
personalized, personal, a personal word, health, challenges, issues, problems, concerns, whatever word you want to use. So we've got two verbs. We specialize in solving your personalized health problems or issues. Because the thing is, something your, your listeners need to understand, we can't get rid of every single noun in our writing. It wouldn't make sense. That, that would be absurd. But the technique, the rhetorical writing technique here is use more verbs than nouns, because verbs are words of action and doing. So it stands to reason that if you want to invigorate your writing and make it more active and drive the narrative along, we have to use more verbs than nouns. That was, uh, again, super helpful. Um, next thing I want to quickly, uh, I know we're kind of coming in at time. I uh, just want to quickly touch on uh, the actual 15 technique framework you have uh, for, for, for persuasive writing. I know you have uh, acronyms as well. Um, mm -hmm. I know you, and you, you break it down. So there's five for planning, five for drafting, five for editing. Yep. Um, I, I think maybe let's start with the planning piece. Uh, when it comes to planning your writing, I think most people aren't really thinking about planning this, you know, they have the paper in front of them, they start writing, right? Mm. So when, yep. when it comes to planning, how do you actually uh, plan for your writing? Okay, I, I, uh, I need to preface my answer to that by saying that um, in my, in my opinion, obviously, I'm a fairly experienced writer, in my opinion, planning is the most creative part of the writing process. Because it's where we we brainstorm all the all the stuff that we might include in our document in our communication, and we're engaging in what I call radiant, radiant divergent thinking. You know, we're thinking about the reader, we're reading articles about the subject, we're we're playing with the ideas, we're thinking about the look and feel. It's it's very divergent thinking, and that's and it's creative, or good planning should be creative. And then when we when we move from planning to drafting, our thinking has to change. It becomes more convergent. And what I mean by that, it becomes more narrow because we are then choosing one word out of a possible 15 that we're going to use to express our idea, or we're choosing a particular phrase. You know, we, we are having to narrow down our choices and commit to a particular way of expressing whatever it is we're trying to say. So people need to understand that planning is not, a, if you plan properly, it's never a waste of time. Uh, it's hugely beneficial. It can be fun. It needs to be fun, I think. It needs to be creative and playful. And there are some major benefits to planning. Um, I mean, I've identified at least five in no particular order. Efficiency. And the way I break that down is that you achieve your goal, your communication goal, faster and more effectively than you would if you didn't plan. Because when we don't plan, we often get halfway through our draft and we think, oh, my goodness, this, I'm, I'm, I'm in a cul-de-sac. I've taken the wrong path. Uh, and they, we start again. And that's known as a rewrite. And a rewrite is a disaster. A rewrite is starting over. Uh, going back to the drawing board, going back to scratch, and it means you've wasted loads of time and energy as well. Two resources we can ill afford to squander. Uh, another, so so speed is a benefit of planning. So if you know if if your listeners want to write more quickly, ironically, they need to spend more time planning. Efficiency, effectiveness, greater impact, confidence as well. I, mean, I don't know about you, but when I when I've got my plan, I know where I'm going. I thought about my reader, I'm clear about my main message, I know what my purpose is. I just relax and I'm, I know where I'm going. I know where I'm taking the reader. And it, it gives me a greater sense of control as well. So there are lots of benefits to planning. You know, your, your listeners need to remember that when we plan, time spent planning is very rarely wasted time. And the other thing I'd say is that if you have time to write, you have time to plan. It's simply about allocating, even if you only have four minutes to produce an email that's important, spend at least one minute planning, two minutes drafting, and the, the final minute editing and checking your work. So if you have time to write, you have time to plan. It's just how you allocate that block of time. Yeah, does that help? 
Yeah, no, that's super helpful. Um, yeah. And I know, like, uh, we probably don't have enough time to get into your whole uh, framework mm -hmm. here. But for the audience that um, is interested, like one thing for for me, for example, just talking to you, I I'm getting excited about writing. So, like, I'm sure you probably okay, have great. a lot of people. I want to just like after this, just sit down and start writing. Um, and so for the people that are interested and, and they, they have this feeling, this motivation to mm -hmm. uh, get started writing, uh, where can they find you, your work, uh, your your book? Uh, how can they yeah. get in touch with you? Okay, so as far as, as far as my books go, and thank you for asking the question, um, both my books are, are available on Amazon. Uh, the, the one on winning bids and tenders is called Winner Takes All. So if you, if you just put uh, Scott Keys, a winner takes all, into the Amazon search bar, it will come up. The second book I wrote, which came out in 2016, which is the best thing I've ever done, well, up to now, uh, so far, that I'm very proud of, is called Rhetorica. And that's the name of my writing system. So if you do, again, in the search bar on Amazon, if you just put in Rhetorica Scott Keezer, so that's the word rhetoric with an A on the end. I've made it my own word. Uh, I've registered it as my own word. And then probably the, you know, if if any of your listeners are on LinkedIn, um, just connect with me on LinkedIn. Scott Keys are the writing guy. Um, I would normally refer people to my website, but I'm I'm re redoing it, remodernizing. If you can remodernize, uh, refreshing the website. So I think for now, uh, the the a better bet is LinkedIn. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'll yeah. leave the links in the description. Great. Uh, thank you. Thanks for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Now, as always, I have my key takeaways from this episode. But before we get into that, I want to share a clip with you from our discussion with Fred Joyle on becoming super bold. There's a lot of people hide behind perfectionism. That's they, they it's, you know, when you were talking about like starting to do, let's say you're starting to do TikTok videos. Guess what? Everybody who ever got good at anything sucked at it at the beginning. And but they just did it. They they acted. They tried. You, anybody who's really good. I mean, Tim Ferriss, who's the master of podcasting at this point, he says, if you listen to my first 10 podcasts, they're embarrassing. They're horrible. Um, he says, but I'm not taking them down because I want people to know that this is how you start. You start by gradually getting better. But people, you know, and hesitant and underconfident people, they use perfectionism as a way to hide and say, well, I'm not I'm not ready to make a TikTok video because I don't have the perfect idea. If you enjoyed this discussion with Scott, I am sure you'll also enjoy the episode with Fred. Check it out wherever you're listening to this podcast. It is episode number 37. Now here are my key takeaways. Number one, read your writing out loud. This is one of the easiest ways to make sure your writing is good. And number two, give yourself permission to write more conversationally. Imagine you're explaining something to a friend. This will bring your voice and your personality into your writing. And that is all for this episode. If you enjoyed this discussion, the easiest way to help out is to leave a review and share with a friend. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week.